Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is a very interesting one on the book of Daniel. This is lesson number six in that series, entitled, From Arrogance to Destruction. It's the lesson for February 8th of 2020, and I think you're going to find it very fascinating as we have. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you now, recognizing your presence here and the guidance of your Holy Spirit. May we see in this lesson what we need to learn is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody who's a student of ancient history, and especially these ancient kingdoms, will be aware that for many years Belshazzar was one of the most compelling arguments used by biblical critics that the book of Daniel could not have been written at the time when it claimed to have been written. They said that Belshazzar never even existed. None of the lists of kings mention him. As far as the king lists are concerned, there is no break between Nabonidus and Cyrus. Darius the Mede does not appear either. What evidence can you cite to support the existence of Belshazzar? Why do you think the extra-biblical accounts of the history of the Babylonian kingdom are so different from the biblical ones? Why didn't God or Daniel mention Nerglisser or even Nabonidus, who figures so prominently in the Greek and Persian versions of history? If God wants us to base our faith on evidence, why couldn't he have provided more in this area? Well, all of that's changed now. Today there is plenty of evidence for Belshazzar. And for those of you who would like to study it in more detail, look at the comments at the end of Daniel 5 in the SDA Bible Commentary. There's, I have pictures I've taken in the British Museum of the little cylinders with the name of Belshazzar on it. Just, that's just one of many places. So now, let's go to the story itself. Did anyone who attended Belshazzar's feast learn anything about God? Scared him to death. Yeah, they should have. <laughs> Do you think anyone's faith actually improved? Do you think anybody in that crowd will be saved? Who knows? Maybe. When God deals with people like Belshazzar, does he ever run out of patience? I don't think God's inclined to run out of patience. Well, notice that a few hours later, many of these people, including Belshazzar, were dead. Was he too drunk to realize what was going on? Was Belshazzar just saying to God, oh, leave me alone, I don't need you? Does that parallel the events at the end of this world's history? So, having mentioned that, how will God bring the whole world to a point of decision at the same time? Would this be like a doctor putting up a sign on his office door which says, this office is now permanently closed because no more patients will ever want to see me? I... On a day like today when we had quite a bit of rain, we always speculate at my clinic, okay, is the rain going to scare the patients away or will everybody decide to run to the clinic, especially the homeless people, and get inside where it's nice and warm and dry uh, to see the doctor? Well, it turns out that almost everybody showed up. So Yeah. <laughs> well, what do we learn about God's dealing with sinners from this story? Is this a case of God finally running out of patience and zapping Belshazzar? Well, who killed Belshazzar? Did God just give him up? Well, I don't hear anybody give me answers here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get, he was, who knows who killed him? He was killed in the battle. Yeah. Do, do you think Belshazzar knew that the Medo-Persian army was gathered outside of Babylon? Probably. They must have, they yeah. must have known. But they felt like they had such a, yeah, yeah, they felt like they had such a strong defense yeah. that nobody would get there. Well, they did, be able to come in. pretty creative way they got in. Yeah. yeah. Five, five, nine, verse 5 to 9, uh, King Chesar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All the blood drains out of your face. <laughs> what do you think was implied by his throwing that elaborate elaborate feast while his enemies are surrounding him. Was he saying, there's nothing for me to worry about. There's no way those guys are going to get in here. Then as having all the tableware come from 
the stuff that had been <coughs> routed out of the temple in Jerusalem. So why do you suppose Belshazzar would ask for those vessels from the temple in Jerusalem to be used just at that time? Had he ever done that before, do you think? Well, he apparently knew about them. Mm -hmm. So he did know things. Yeah. Um. Um, is it possible that they were the most beautiful vessels that anybody had ever seen up to that time in history? They were made by people with special skills from God. Yeah. Probably. We don't know that for sure, but... So how much did Belshazzar know about the history of Nebuchadnezzar's relationship with God? I mean, he must have known oh, yeah. quite a bit of that story. Well, I, I his, the queen mother said, you knew all that. Yeah. You knew all that. So he knew. Oh, that you couldn't, you couldn't go through life and not know the stories of your ancestry. Yeah. I mean, this is his grandfather. Yeah, exactly. Well, in 539 B.C., where there's not any question about that date as far as I know. On that night of feasting and revelry, God demonstrated that he was in charge of the events on planet Earth. As predicted in Daniel 2, world domination passed at that point from Babylon to Medo-Persia, from Nabonidus and Belshazzar to Cyrus and Darius the Mede. Just right according to the clockwork. And if the chronology is right, he's about 49 years old, Belshazzar, mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, could be. And chronology, those chronologies at that point in history are pretty reliable. Um, well, look at these verses found in Daniel, the first few verses of Daniel 5. Let me see if I can make this a little bit, uh, pretty good size. Belshazzar's Banquet. One night, King Belshazzar invited a thousand noblemen to a great banquet, and they drank wine together. While they were drinking, Belshazzar gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups and bowls, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had carried off from the temple in Jerusalem. Now, we need to mention in passing here that the Hebrews are very generous in their use of the word father. It could be father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and they still call him father. Or Father Abraham. Father Abraham, yeah. The king sent for them so that he, his noblemen, his wives, and his concubines could drink out of them. At once the gold cups and bowls were brought, brought in, and they all drank wine out of them. And praise the gods of gold, silver, and da-da-da. So, and we know where those, those vessels came from, don't we? Yeah, the temple. Yeah. Well, they were kind of as an insult to God that they were using the temple yeah. uh, gold and silver uh, uh, dishes or g uh, bowls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's an interesting <coughs> possible parallel found in Revelation 14, verses 4 to 6. The woman was dressed, and this is talking about Great Babylon. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and covered with gold ornaments, precious stones and pearls. In her hand, she held a gold cup full of obscene and filthy, filthy things, the result of her immorality. On her forehead was written a name that has a secret meaning, Great Babylon, the mother of all the prostitutes and perverts in the world. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's people and the blood of those who were killed because they had been loyal to Jesus. Does that sound of, sort of similar? Mm -hmm. It does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, so what was Belshazzar trying to, to do? Was he trying to raise his own gods up in the sight of all of his buddies there and trying to claim that, well, we have conquered the world and so forth. Um, kind of seems like that, doesn't it? Yeah, he was kind of doing the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar did when he was strutting around on his balcony saying, yep. look at this great Babylon that I have built. Yep. And Belshazzar was kind of doing the same thing. Mm. Well, it's very interesting to notice in Daniel 5, four, verse 4, that Belshazzar praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. These are exactly the things mentioned in Daniel 2 and in the same order, except that clay was replaced by wood. Do you think this sequence is accidental? Or is this from the most, from the most expensive down to the cheapest? Or what do you think? 
Of course, the stone at the end refers to Daniel 2, 44 and 45. Let's just read that for a moment. At the time of those rulers, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never end. It will never be conquered, but will completely destroy all those empires and then last forever. You saw how a stone broke loose from a cliff without anyone touching it and how it struck the statue made of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God is telling your majesty what will happen in the future. I have told you exactly what you dreamt and have given you its true meaning. I don't know whether Nebuchadnezzar's knees were shaking at that point or not, but... Mm -hmm. Well, comparing that great Babylon statement in Revelation with this story, it is clear that this final night of drunkenness and debauchery under the control of Belshazzar was a clear parallel with the woman described in Revelation 17, 46. She's even called Great Babylon. So, are there any ways in which our society and culture today are following the example of Belshazzar and the others in that great feast? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Constantly. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that we're not a part of that? Watch and pray. Yeah. Look at the next few verses. Suddenly a human hand appeared and began writing on the plaster wall of the palace where the light from the lamps was shining most brightly. And the king saw the hand as it was, writ it was writing. He turned pale and was so frightened that his knees began to shake. He shouted for someone to bring in the magicians, wizards, and astrologers. When they came in, the king said to them, Anyone who can read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in robes of royal purple, wear a gold chain of honor around his neck, and be the third in power in the kingdom. The royal advisors came forward, but none of them could read the writing or tell the king what it meant. In his distress, King Belshazzar grew even paler, and his nobleman had no idea what to do. Wow. Is this, uh, is this, are we seeing the utter uselessness of these gods? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's other passages. Look at Psalm 96, 5. That the gods of all other nations are only idols, but the, the Lord created the heavens. Glory and majesty surround him. Power and beauty fill his temple. And then Colossians 1, 15 to 17. Christ is a visible likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn son, superior to all created things. By the way, that firstborn son is not talking about birth as we know it. It's talking about uh, a special position, the first of a certain type. For through him God created everything in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. God created the whole universe through him and for him. Christ existed before all things, and in union with him, all things have their proper place. Wow. Well, at a time of great fear and possible national crisis, Belshazzar did what Nebuchadnezzar had done in the past. He called for his fortune tellers, magicians, sorcerers, and wizards. And you can read about that in Daniel 2, 2, and 4, 7. Having called a feast to celebrate his so-called gods and trying to prove the superiority of those gods, over the God of Israel, Belshazzar needed to, of course, call on the wise man of those gods. So, do you think God intentionally confused the wise men? The real God confused the wise men? They confused themselves. Yes. They confused themselves. <laughs> the, no. Now, we need to be clear. The language that was written on that wall, I used to think that maybe it was Hebrew, and that's why they couldn't understand. No, it was Aramaic. It was their language. But they couldn't figure out what, what it meant. Well, how futile, how futile is it to call in the wisdom of this world? Paul addressed that question in 1 Corinthians 1, 20 and 21. Dennis, I think you have something on that. So then, where does that leave the wise or the scholars? For the skillful debaters of this world, God has shown that this world's wisdom is foolishness. For God, in his wisdom, made it impossible for people to know him by means of their own wisdom, instead by means of the so-called foolish message, foolish message we preach. God decided to save those who believe. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I... I Every once in a while, I stop and think about Paul's mission. 
He went, he said, I want to, I want to enter new territories. I don't want to come to some place where someone's already got started the work. I want to enter a new territory. I wonder what would happen. You know, he, suppose he arrives at this new city. He goes into the marketplace and he starts talking and people gather around and listen to him. And then he talks about someone who has risen from the dead and gone to heaven and has raised other people from the dead and so forth. And if you were one of the men at such a gathering, you went home that night, what would you say to your wife? Hmm. We ran into a crazy man? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think, think about it. I think that's kind of what the, the reaction on Mars Hill when, yeah. when he brought up the res resurrection from the dead. And yeah, Acts 17. Yeah. I think it was, pretty sure it is. Well, was God just playing with Belshazzar then? Did those wise men of Babylon truly not have any idea what the message on the wall meant? The message was written in Aramaic, which was their language. Were they too drunk to understand the meaning? Or were they afraid to tell the king what they thought? They were probably afraid that if they would offend him, off with their heads. That was a possibility. So, yeah. <clears throat> We do not know where the queen mother was at that time, but apparently she heard the noise and revelry that was taking place and went to see what was happening. And here's the story. In his distress, King Belshazzar grew even paler and his nobleman had no idea what to do. The queen mother heard the noise made by the king and his nobleman and entered the banqueting hall. And I, you know, I, I, I try to think, I don't, we don't know where she was, but she was within earshot. And I'm sure they were making lots of noise, drinking and carrying on. And then all of a sudden, a hand showed up on the wall. What do you suppose was the change in the noise? Oh, they were screaming. No, I think it got real quiet for a while. <laughs> well, well, there was a change in the rhythm of the noise. There was noise. certainly a change in the noise. There had to be, yeah. I mean, if you saw that, you wouldn't be saying anything. You could hardly, you'd just be speechless, it seems mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. She probably thought, uh-oh, what's happened? Mm -hmm. So she came to the banqueting hall. She said, may your majesty live forever. Please do not be so disturbed and look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods or the holy God in him. When your father was king, this man showed good sense, knowledge, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods. Now, this is interesting because we're talking Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. She has great respect for Daniel. She might have been a believer, who knows? Maybe. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, made him chief. Of, this is a couple more references to Nebuchadnezzar being the father when he was really the grandfather. Made him chief of the fortune tellers, magicians, wizards, and astrologers. He has unusual ability and is wise and skillful in interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining mysteries. So send for this man Daniel, whom the king uh, named Belteshat whom the king named Belteshazzar, and he will tell you what all this means. And about that time, Belshazzar was probably thinking, I don't want that guy here. <laughs> no doubt that banquet hall was filled with revelry and mirth and was quite noisy. How do you think the noise changed when that hand suddenly appeared <laughs> writing on the wall? What kind of noise followed? He became speechless. Yeah. And I, I suspect that um, the, hand, the, the, the hand, handwriting on the wall was probably illuminated some way or other, not just from candlelight or, or some lamplight or something like this. I think well, God... Sure to draw attention to yeah. it. Yeah, and be shiny, yeah. They didn't have electric lights, so. No, but God has electric lights. Yeah. As we know, the Queen Mother, who was a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, reminded Belshazzar what she, he should have known already about Daniel. And we already read that. Given the history that he knew of past experiences like this one, why do you think Belshazzar did not go immediately to Daniel? Probably too sozzled to remember. It well, wasn't his custom to <clears throat> reach out for Daniel. He had his, yeah. his advisors, and those are the ones that he trusted. And He was a young guy, and Daniel is old, retired, and yeah. Yeah. probably... <clears throat> he always told him what he wanted to hear, probably. <laughs> his, his, his advisors, yeah. It's almost certain that Daniel was more than 80 years old, perhaps even more than 90 at that time. 
Maybe Daniel was in semi-retirement. Nevertheless, his skills could hardly have been forgotten. Paul talked about what happens to people who ignore God's plans for their lives and seek to do things the way they choose. You can read about that, about the devastating results in Romans 1, 16 to 32. I'm going to just read a few verses from that. I have complete confidence. This is Paul writing Romans 1, 16 and following. I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. It is through faith from beginning to end, as the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. And then he talks about God's wrath, God's anger, as being revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. So think about our day. What kind of evil ways are preventing the truth from being known? Wow. Well, we know if you drop down to verse 24, we see some of the results. And so God has given those people over to the filthy things their hearts desire, and they do shameful things with each other. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve what God has created instead of the Creator Himself, who is to be praised forever. And then verse 26, Because they do this, God has given them over to shameful passions. Even the women pervert the natural use of their sex by unnatural acts. And then down to 28, Because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, He has given them over to corrupt minds so that they do the things that they should not do. Wow. That's quite a indictment, huh? Yeah. Well, going on with our story back with Daniel, what did Daniel mention as being, Bel as being Belshazzar's problems, Margaret? Well, first, Belshazzar totally has ignored the experience of Nebuchadnezzar. Otherwise, he would have repented and humbled himself like his predecessor. Second, Belshazzar has used the temple vessels in order to drink wine and praise his idols. Here Daniel mentions the six kinds of materials used to make idols in almost the same order noted previously. Third, the king has neglected to glorify God, the one who holds your breath in his hands and owns all of your ways. This is from wow. Daniel 5.23. <laughs> Having addressed the failures of the king, Daniel proceeds to the interpretation. Now we learn that the divine graffiti, <laughs> nice name for it, the divine graffiti consists of three Aramaic verbs, the f with the first repeated. Their basic meaning should have been known to the king and his sages. Mini, counted, tekel, weighed, and Paris, divided. With the Medo-Persian army at the gates of Babylon, the king and the sages must have suspected some ominous meaning in that writing, but the sages do not dare to say something unpleasant to the king. Only Daniel proves capable of decoding the actual message into a meaningful statement in order to convey its full meaning to Belshazzar. Meaning, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. This is Daniel 5, 26 to 28, New King James Version. It's interesting. And it's from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study yeah. Guide, too. It's interesting that word Perez is very closely to the word for Persians, and it's, it's, clo it's closely related to the word, their word for divided. As Christians, we recognize that all judgment ultimately comes from God. And there's lots of verses for that. Ecclesiastes 3, 17, 8, 11, Matthew 12, 36, Romans 14, 12, etc. As we know, the forces of Cyrus had managed to temporarily divert the Euphrates River, thus lowering the level in the river so far enough so they could march under the iron gates that hung down into the water and were assumed to be capable of protecting the city. Thus the invaders were able to march into the middle of the city and conquer the city without any battle. What might that teach us about future events and the end of the world? Final movements will be rapid ones. Yeah. And unexpected. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what... When they, yeah, when they say peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction. Yeah. 
Well, look at what happened with Belshazzar. Immediately, Belshazzar ordered his servants to dress Daniel in a robe of royal purple and to hang a gold chain of honor around his neck, and he made him the third in power in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar, the king of Babylonia, was killed, and Darius the Mede, who was then 62 years old, seized royal power. Okay, well, there's similarities to that. Look at a couple of verses in Revelation again. A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. Great Babylon, great Babylon. Why does great Babylon end up being the subject of Revelation? Is it talking about the old riddle Babylon? Well, it could refer to the Tower of Babel where yeah. the languages were confused and I guess the word means confusion and and then Babylon cont uh, is set up in the statue, you know, in the sequence. Yeah. There's a, uh, a sense in which God has directed that sequence to set up kings and take down kings. I don't know whether I should take time to do it right now, but in second, in first and second Peter, there's some. Maybe I'll just take a moment. Let's look at this. I think there's a reason why he uses the term. Um, look at first Peter chapter five. Final greetings. Your sister church in Babylon, also chosen by God, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Huh. Is that thinking about it. John writes Revelation? Yes. That's way after this happened. Yes. Belshazzar. Who was the first prophet to talk about Babylon falling? Was there somebody that said Babylon will fall? Well, there's another clue here. If you look at the little print. As in the book of Revelation, this probably refers to Rome. Oh. Because if you go over to Second Peter, he'll say, um, um, and this is Peter still talking, and so I will always remind you of these matters, even though you already know them and are firmly grounded in the truth you have received. I think it, only, it is only, it only right for me to stir up your memory of these matters as long as I'm still alive. I know that I shall soon put off this mortal body as our Lord Jesus Christ plainly told me. I will do my best then to provide a way for you to remember these matters at all times after my death. So Mark was with him. Where was Peter at the end, near the end of his life? Was, uh, he was crucified upside down in Rome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Mark was with him. And guess who wrote the book of Mark? Which was really Peter's gospel. Mark probably. Mark was yeah. Peter's gospel. Back to my question. Mm -hmm. Was there a prophet before Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar's time that talked about Babylon falling? Yes. Oh, yes. Who? Uh, Isaiah. Yeah, Clear back, he mentioned Cyrus by name. 160 years or so before, wasn't it? Yeah. So, oh, he mentioned so he Cyrus. Mentions Babylon. Yeah. All right. Yeah, absolutely. So exactly as announced by the prophet, Babylon does fall, and it does so quickly while the king and his couriers drink. The city falls without a battle. According to the historian Herodotus, the Persians dug a canal to divert the Euphrates and marched into the city on the riverbed. The city already surrendering herself later that same night. Uh, yeah. Has his father, King Nabonidus, had left the city that same night or before, had already gone away, surrendering himself later to the new rulers. Thus, the greatest empire humanity has ever known to this point comes to an end. Babylon, the head of gold, is no more. And that's taken from our lesson guide Thursday, okay. February 6th. You going to continue on there? Belshazzar had been given many opportunities for knowing and doing the will of God. He had seen his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, banished from the society of men. He had seen the intellect 
in which the proud monarch glorified, taken away by the one who gave it. He had seen the king driven from his kingdom and made the companion of beasts of the field, but Belshazzar's love of amusement and self-glorification effaced the lessons he should never have forgotten, and he committed sins similar to those brought that brought signal judgments on Nebuchadnezzar. He wasted the opportunities graciously, grant, graciously granted to him, neglecting to use the opportunities within his reach for becoming acquainted with the truth. Ellen G. White. See, it makes me wonder how much he really knew about the earlier life of his grandfather. I. He, he had to be told, but he yeah. was pretty young. Yeah, I mean with his mother, who apparently had a very high respect for Daniel. She yeah. must have. She must have told him all of those all things. All the time, growing up, I his, would think so. Bedtime stories. Absolutely, I think. I think we was fully educated. Yeah, well, in verse twenty-two, Daniel says to him, "Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this." Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Does this story tell us anything about the plagues at the end of time? Well, the book of Revelation suggests that the final plagues will come after probation closes. There will be no more opportunity for anyone to repent and come back to God. So is this, case of God, is this a case of God going berserk? Is this an example of what happens when God's mercy runs out? Is this God's strange work as mentioned in Isaiah 28, 21? Or is it God, the ultimate physician, making a diagnosis regarding those who refuse his care? So which do you think it is? Well, even in, uh, in the Old Testament, Ephraim is joined to his idols, leave him alone. Hosea 4, 7. Yep. So, um, and there is this apparently some sequence because uh, back in, I think in Deuteronomy, uh, they, uh, um, under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And uh, the cup of the iniquity of the Amorites was not full yet. So there is a certain point over time where a person can no longer respond. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, I mean, God has to eventually bring the great controversy to a conclusion. That's one of the things we, we you know, God could say, well, I'm tired of waiting any longer. Just zap everybody and take home the ones he wants to take and leave the others behind. He could do that. He has the ability to do that. But he doesn't operate like that. He will not bring this whole mess to a conclusion until every person, sinner and saint, has had an opportunity to look at the evidence and make a decision. You know, from our Seventh-day Adventist perspective, when the seven last plagues start, has probation closed before that time? Yes. We're quite sure of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, take another look at the details and the circumstances of the end time plagues. Is there any evidence that any of the wicked will turn back to God? So, as I understand it, the plagues happen because Satan is determined, absolutely determined to destroy the righteous. He wants to get rid of the righteous and then he wants to turn to God and say, okay, everybody left on planet Earth here is mine. Just leave me, me and my, my people to have this world. You can take your people and go to the rest of the universe. You can have that. But just leave this world to me. And God says, nope, not going to do that. I'm not going to let you destroy my people at this point in time because they have a very important function to, to, to demonstrate. They have to show that they can stand up no matter what you bring against them. And it just makes Satan furious. Just like Job. Yeah. Well, do these plagues just prove that no one on the devil's side has any intention of coming back to God? I think there's some verification. I mean, that, that sounds like the only reason to do that is to, yeah. to show, you know, I've tried everything. I'm bringing this to a close. 
but nobody responds. It, if yeah. you read, ba if you were to read there in Revelation, they they curse God because yeah. of the plagues. They don't ask for help. They don't ask nope. for uh, mercy or for anything from God. They just want to. So would this just be? Yeah, would this just be one of several proofs that God offers to demonstrate that His work is finished, and there's not another, than not anyone else who's willing to listen to Him and be one? Isn't God able to read minds and hearts and know that everyone has fully and completely and finally made up his or her mind? God has run out of patience, that's with the T-S, but not patience with the C-E. The wicked have refused God's final offer of healing. Is it possible at this point in time, God is demonstrating that even he is powerless to do anything more to change his beloved but wicked children? think the time is going to come when God is going to have to say, there's nothing more I can do. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> when there's nothing more that God can do for sinners, is there any reason for him to wait any longer in coming back? I don't think so. Each one of us will either finally accept God's plan of treatment, called salvation, for us, or will reject it. But even if Belshazzar might eventually be saved, and even if he learned something from those dreaded events of his last night, it did not prevent the consequences. There are many other examples in Scripture of people whose actions led to serious consequences, but who will ultimately be saved. Can you think of someone? Right David there. is an obvious yeah. example, yeah. right? Yeah. After committing that horrible crime with Bathsheba and Uriah, his kingdom almost fell apart. Ultimately, four of his sons died, including the ones that were supposed to be his replacement. But we have every reason to believe that David will be in heaven. Another example is Hezekiah. Apparently, he ultimately will be saved and was a friend of God. But his actions in showing the wealth of his country to the Babylonian visitors ultimately led to the Babylonian army returning to take it. Carrie, I think you have something on that. Yes. In that last night of mad folly, Belshazzar and his lords had filled up the measure of their guilt and the guilt of the Chaldean kingdom. No longer could God's restraining hand ward off the impending evil. Through manifold providences, God had sought to teach them reverence for his law. We would have healed Babylon, he declared to those whose judgment was now reaching under heaven. But she is not healed. Uh, and it gives the reference of Jeremiah 51, 9 there. Because of the strange perversity of the human heart, God had at last found it necessary to pass the irrevocable sentence. Belshazzar was to fall and his kingdom was to pass in other hands. And that comes from Prophets and Kings, page 530, paragraph 3. Every nation that has come upon the stage of action has been permitted to occupy its place on the earth, that the fact might be determined whether it would fulfill the purposes of the Watcher and the Holy One. Let me interrupt for a second. Have any of the nations that have come on the stage of human history served God? How many political organizations can you think of that have served God? Not too many. Really none. Oh. Ultimately none. Oh. Some have started out pretty well. There was Israel in the days of David. That was pretty good. Uh, one thing we can think of sometimes, I, I sometimes think the early, the early years of America were, were pretty good in some respects. Yeah. Go ahead. Prophecy has traced the rise and progress of the world's great empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. With each of these, as with the nations of less power, history has repeated itself. Each has had its period of test, each has failed, its glory faded, its power departed. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, appear as if dependent on the will and prowess of man. Shaping of events seems to a great degree to be, to be determined by his power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold above, behind, and through all the play 
and counterplay of human interest and power and passions, the agencies of the All-Merciful One silently, patiently working out the counsels of His own will. Okay. <coughs> wow. Ellen White again. You think that um, you can look at the events that are happening in our word, world today and see God's hand working behind? Or is God just gradually withdrawing back and back and back and letting the devil have more and more control? What do you think? That's logical. Sometimes look that way. <laughs> it really does. Evil has to be shown for what it really is. Yeah. The, the education process it has to have stay in power for eternity. Yeah. Is God constrained by certain rules of engagement? Yes. God cannot lie. Mm -hmm. Well, he's, he's only limited by his love. Yeah. That's he limits himself. Think, think about these two adversaries. God operates by love, love. and trust and truth. Mm -hmm. The devil operates by lying, deceiving, I mean, deception killing, deception, er every, every evil thing you can possibly imagine. It, it, it doesn't even seem like it would be fair to have that kind of a battle. And the yet, advers The adversary uses deception and extortion to control mm. the minds of people. And God is just the opposite, just mm. freedom to make a choice. We've been given dominion, Genesis, what, Genesis 1? Yeah. You, to, to, and it, ask the question, why, why did sin arise? Not because some flaw in the way God's no. government is. It's just you have to have the freedom to make the choices. So, in freedom, without freedom, there would be no love. There could not Absolutely. be any love. And also, love is more than just a warm, fuzzy feeling. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, the way God operates. Yeah. You have to have the freedom. Without freedom to choose, no love. So, can you think of some things that maybe God would like to do that He can't do? I can well, think of one great big one. You can't force you to love. Yeah. Well, and God would love to save everybody, but he can't. Well, Because if he did, he would just, the great controversy would just continue on. If we use the term uh, save as salvation or health or healing, mm -hmm. uh, and of course in the Old Testament, God's complaint is you don't listen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go on to the prophets, he says, well, I'll heal you. I'll restore you. But how does he do it? Education. Mm -hmm. A demonstration. Yeah. And then Paul says in Romans 3.25, Jesus' death was to demonstrate God's righteousness. Yeah. Three times, one right after the other. Demonstrate, demonstrate. What's he doing? He's teaching. Yeah. The devil does everything possible to get around, to avoid, or to undermine God's rules. But God always plays fairly by his self-imposed rules. He, he, he can't do anything else, or, or so long as he's the kind of God he is. These rules demonstrate the fact that God will, for eternity, operate an orderly universe in which both love and hate are possible. This is the only way to run God's kind of universe. If God chose to step in and prevent evil consequences from happening as a result of evil behavior, then an orderly universe would no longer exist. How many people today are living their lives hoping somehow they can do the evil but avoid the consequences? That is such a prevalent thing going on in our world. Would God ever choose to violate our freedom and act in a disorderly way in order to save some of us? No. He might want to. He wants to save everybody. But he can't. Could he? Well, why does he or why doesn't he? I don't think he can. No, I mean, he can't. not because he, he's not able to, but because it would be a violation of everything he stands for. Well, yeah, and it would be a violation of our freedom. He gave us the choice to choose him or not. Yep. I think uh, sin is a destructive thing. Yeah. And it destroys us until there's... It's not that God stops loving, but... There, we reach a point where we're so destroyed there's nothing left to love. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. We don't, we don't respond. 
We if, can't if, have a relationship. We yeah. can't r receive it's, from him. We can no longer re receive from the giver. Yeah. Romans 6, 23, sin pays its wage, death. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and sin is bad enough. Mm -hmm. God doesn't need to make it worse no. by imposing some arbitrary no. rule or regulation. God will act on occasions such as this one to get our attention when things have become very serious. This is to give us an opportunity to think again about what the most important issues are. The question here is not power or might, but what kind of a universe we live in and what kind of a God rules over it. While well, Belshazzar and his associates must have known that the armies of Medo-Persia were outside the city, they felt no fear. Like, man, the balls of Babylon. They were almost 40 feet high and there was 25 feet thick with a moat in between the outside wall and the inner wall. No human army in those days could have conquered them. Furthermore, Babylon had an endless water supply. The, the Euphrates River was running right through the middle of the city and enough food in hand to survive for years. I'm, I'm sure the military people stood up on the wall and just laughed at the Medo-Persians out there. What are you guys wasting your time out there, right? Did they ever, through, through archaeological evidence, find out where they diverted, where that diversion came from? Yes, about? I, I think they have. They yeah. yeah, I believe so. Well, how does this compare with our current world's attitudes toward God and the future? Mm. How many people today are truly concerned about the fact that God might one day end human history? I don't think most people in the world even crosses their mind. No. Nope. They're not thinking about consequences. Well, Jim? How does this compare with their curtain world's attitude toward God in the future. How many people are truly concerned about the fact that God might one day end human history? The history of nations speaks to us today. To every nation and to every individual, God has assigned a place in his great plan. Today, men and nations are being tested by the, pummel, by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny, and God is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. You mentioned something about, you know, God wants us to listen. One year I took my highlighter, my orange highlighter, and I started reading the Bible through that year, and every time I came to anything that said, pay attention or listen, I highlighted it. I was just conscious of doing that, and it's astounding. You hardly go through any two pages in the Bible yeah. without seeing. Yeah. Somewhere God is calling. Mm -hmm. Our problem is we aren't listening. Hero Israel. Yeah. yeah. Over and over he said, listen up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, you, or you don't listen. You're not listening. Yeah. That's his that's complaint. Same, What's the yeah. problem? Yeah. You're not listening. And, and sometimes you hear it and see it in parallel. Yeah, it's You're, real interesting how yeah. often that happens. And, and that implies God's teaching. Yeah. Okay? He's not dictating. He's and uh, what we talk about the Ten Commandments, uh, that really sounds kind of like control, right? Mm -hmm. But it's another way, in fact, the, one of the be uh, definitions is a, it's a um, prescription. Mm -hmm. Instructions, God's instructions. But, but if you violate, uh, for example, uh, if it's a prescription, and it's also a description, it's a description of the way intelligent creatures will conduct themselves for eternity. Mm -hmm. But They're what we call the Ten Commandments, okay? It's, it's so simple. And if it's not simple, it's probably got some holes in it. Because <laughs> it, it, it's too, it, it's got to be so people can understand. Yeah. Well, Babylon had reached a place where they felt that their city was impregnable. They did not see any reason to fear. Well, back in 2009, the atheists or humanists in London ran a series of ads on the sides of double-decker buses in London. Those ads said, there's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Yeah. That was Dawkins, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I remember that. Does that sound like Babylon? Yeah. Sounds like Belshazzar, doesn't it? Belshazzar demonstrated his ultimate arrogance and his blasphemous attitude toward the true God. By taking the vessels from the temple in Jerusalem and drinking wine from them, he was showing his ultimate contempt for God himself. 
Was that Belshazzar's worst and final sin? Well, he has a whole lot of wives and a whole lot of concubines. Who knows what he was doing with all them? Up to that point in history, it seems like Babylon was winning all the battles against Jerusalem. But suddenly the tables turned. Prophecies from Isaiah had predicted that Cyrus would one day conquer Babylon. There we go. And at that time of Belshazzar's at the time of Belshazzar's feast and the invasion of the city by the army through the riverbed, it was happening. Many scholars recognize that the Queen Mother who came in and recommended consulting Daniel was Nitocris, daughter of Nebuchadnezzar and wife of Nabonidus and mother of Belshazzar. How do you think she felt about her father's eventual conversion? You know, the way she speaks about Daniel makes you think that she may have had some thing, pretty thinking, pretty straight thinking. Yeah. Obviously, she was not in attendance at Belshazzar's feast. Why do you think that was? I mean, shouldn't he have invited his mother? Why would any woman want to be with the thousand nobles that are sloshed? Not exactly the greatest place to be. No. Well, whereas Daniel had been very deferential and respectful in speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, even at times when he was delivering terrible predictions, in this case, the elderly Daniel was not showing much deference for the young Belshazzar. So what can we learn from this story of Babylon's fall and Belshazzar's foolishness that might be helpful to us? Is it important for us to see what God has done in the past in order to better understand what he might do in the future? Do we have any hint in the Bible that God doesn't change? It says that in Malachi 3, 6, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the way God, I mean, if we understand God's character, we, we, we think about how he might behave, we look at how he's behaved in the past, that should be a good clue, right? Usually it is. Ellen White has this interesting statement. In reviewing our past history, Having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God. Now think about, I, I stop and think about Ellen White's status. She was born in 1927. 18. 18. I'm sorry, 18, eight, thank 18. you, 1827. <laughs> she was a teenager when the Great Disappointment happened. And she grew with the Adventist movement from the beginning all the way from the Great Disappointment all the way up to here where we are now. We have nothing to fear. For, uh, as I see what God has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. That's a wonderful comment. Yeah. Just think about what that says. Yeah. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Now, some people just superficially reading that say, oh, well, that means we've done everything right. Does it say that? No. It doesn't. We are now a strong people. If we will put our trust in the Lord, for we are handling the mighty truths of the Word of God, we have everything to be thankful for. That was written somewhere around 1893. There's, I'm, I'm probably off by a little bit, but the Adventist church had about 10,000 members at that point. What would you say today to a church that has, what, 23 million? Note carefully that we are to be thankful for the way God has led us. That does not mean that we should be thankful for the times that we have departed from God's leadings. If, we have been one of the, if you had been one of the high officials in Babylon in those days and had been invited to that feast, what would you have thought about Belshazzar's rule and the events, events of that night? What do you think caused Belshazzar to call for the items from the Jewish temple to be used for himself and his people to drink from that night? Was he intentionally spitting in God's face? Good question. Yeah. Were those That's vessels the most beautiful ones that had ever been created up to that time? Also possible. Was Belshazzar specifically trying to show his contempt for Daniel and Daniel's God who had multiple, had multiple times humbled his grandfather? Well, Belshazzar certainly could remember well the final days of Nebuchadnezzar, although with a careful putting together, Jim, you had mentioned that earlier we were discussing, he may not have been very old when in the final days of Nebuchadnezzar. He, he had to know all about it because yeah. he had people older than him that were with him. Including his mother. Jux says yeah. that uh, 
too. You know, he's he had opportunity to mm -hmm. learn yeah. mm -hmm. from his elders about his grandfather. Now we believe. Well, let me just ask you a question. Do you think you do you think Nebuchadnezzar will be in heaven? I kind of think so. so. Yeah, there's a chance. I think maybe his daughter might too. So. Yeah, wouldn't that be wonderful? Be lovely to ask. To be able it be wonderful to listen to their account of what happened that night? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I just think, I wonder too, of all the thousand nobles in the room, did any escape with their life? Were they all butchered? We don't know that. We don't know. We don't. Well, the question would be, you know, Daniel ended up in a high position in the next government. Did any of the other people there, I mean, there must have been people there with all kinds of high positions, with skills of various kinds. You'd hope the Queen Mother would have made it. Yeah, yeah, you would think so. Wow. Well, did Nebuchadnezzar live a humble and God-fearing life in those final days? No. Did that offend Belshazzar? Good questions. Think yeah. about it. What are the gods that are held up in our day? Well, we don't worship idols, right? Well, no. Not in the oldest sense. <laughs> <laughs> lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, boastful pride yeah. of life. It's all part of the same ongoing system of the world. False concept of God is idolatry. Yep. Uh, and who's how many, exempt from that? How many people today are worshiping money? Yes. Yeah. How many do, people yeah. today are worshiping status? Yes. How many people think that if you go around with a lot of letters pa tacked onto the end of your name, that you can say nothing wrong? You just obviously you're you must be right. And position, you know, and fame and career. I mean, those are those are things that people give their life for, even they're willing to die for in some cases. And uh, God is not a part of their thinking. God could come along some time and, and bring this whole earth to, a, to an end. just doesn't seem possible. And I think that's especially two of our young people today. You know, they're busy doing, listening to their iPods and their, their iPhones and Talking to their friends on FaceTime and I mean, well, not just FaceTime, all those, you know, Facebook and all those other things. And so, we'll ask you out there, what do you Please. think is going to happen to this earth? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of worshiping you, of respecting your name, and to really caring about what might happen. We know that our world is deteriorating that there's many ways in which things are becoming worse. Help us not to make the mistake of going down with it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.